Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to this uh, webinar uh, on the recommendations made by the 50th GST Council uh, meeting, which was held recently. Uh, it has been raining all across India, and we find a flurry of clarifications, uh, uh, most of them beneficial for the industry, uh, also being uh, issued by the GST Council. This council, uh, apart from being the 50th council meeting, has historic uh, in many aspects. Uh, it culminates the uh, completion of six year of uh, introduction of GST in India. It also, uh, to commemorate the event, we found that the post office has also issued a stamp. Uh, another feature which is very interesting for all the council uh, meetings that we see that has been held in the past, is that all decisions have been taken with unanimous, uh, uh, with unanimity. Uh, and, and if, I don't know if anyone has checked uh, whether this could qualify for an entry in the Guinness Book of World Record uh, for, uh, you know, 50th meeting uh, in the government uh, having diverse interest, but all decisions have been taken unanimously. Uh, with this, uh, we invite you for this, uh, interesting one hour session. Uh, my colleagues Kulraj and Ruturaj would participate uh, in the discussion. Uh, Ruturaj uh, would moderate the session and uh, Kulraj and myself would like to bring the important changes uh, which has been brought about uh, with this council meeting. So over to you, Ruturaj. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Neeraj mentioned, the 50th uh, GST Council meeting, which was concluded on 11th of this month, it has brought along quite a few proposals. Proposals concerning rate changes, proposal concerning streamline of compliances, some trade facilitation measures, and a lot of clarifications on contentious issues. Before we deep dive into the clarifications, which has been given by CBIC, uh, Neeraj, can you just quickly walk us through some important changes other than the clarification which have been proposed by the council in this meeting? Yeah, sure. So if we look at uh, the changes which have been made other than the clarifications, uh, by and large, these involves the change in rate, uh, certain issues being classified, uh, clarified, and of course, the burning issue on the online gaming. Uh, so we have uh, the compensation cess of 22%, which was applicable to sports utility vehicle. And there were certain conditions prescribed uh, regarding the uh, laden or unladen weight of the vehicle. Now, uh, what the council has proposed is the amendment in the notification uh, to include all utility vehicles and not just restricted to a sports utility vehicle to be covered within the entry of 22%. And it is also sort of, uh, you know, uh, put a condition to say that while considering the ground clearance of 170 millimeters, it has to be the unladen weight, which means that if let's say the capacity of the vehicle is uh, five or seven persons, one way which uh, one could have, you know, considered the ground clearance was by having passengers of five and seven and then calculating the ground clearance. Now the notification seeks to amend uh, and, and, and provide that 170 millimeter ground clearance will be an unladen condition. So in that sense, it sort of brings uh, most of the vehicles which are classified as utility, whether it's MUV, LUV, within the coverage of 22% uh, compensation says. Another important uh, uh, clarification or uh, being provided is to say that if there is any service being received from a director, uh, then the company will not be liable to pay tax in the reverse charge. So we all know a director fee uh, is, is something which is covered by the reverse charge. But let's say a director is providing a separate service. An example being quoted is, let's say, if uh, any uh, property of the vehicle uh, of the director has been rented out. Uh, and rent charges are being collected, then in that situation, uh, the director, if at all, could be liable to pay tax under forward charge, and the company will not be under any obligation uh, to pay tax under reverse charge. Another important uh, you know, clarification or change which has been discussed, which is uh, 
uh, you know, welcome and uh, benefit will be available to consumers at large is relating to the tax rate being applicable when we go to a cinema hall. So, uh, you know, we buy the cold drinks, the popcorn and a lot of snacks uh, while watching a movie. Uh, so, till, so far, the practice was to charge 18% uh, as the GST rate uh, on these supplies as well. But the council has clarified and uh, made amendments to say that uh, it will get the benefit of restaurant service, which is taxable at 5%. And, and therefore, while the movie ticket uh, will attract the rate of 18%, the food, et cetera, that we buy in a cinema theater will attract the rate of 5%. This, of course, is subject to the condition that uh, we are not buying a package uh, to say that where uh, any theater is selling a package of ticket along with food. In that situation, the principles of composite supply will uh, come into play. And therefore, the rate applicable to the principal supply, which is the cinema, will become applicable. So we might find a lot of unbundling being done uh, to ensure that the food charges uh, attract the rate of 5%. Uh, also, one more important aspect to be borne in mind is the anti-profiteering uh, being applicable wherever the rate changes has been notified. So we might see the authorities looking at this very closely to identify and ensure that the benefit of reduced rate is being passed on to the consumers. Another uh, burning issue is, uh, which has attracted a lot of media attention, is the provision of uh, a rate of 28% on online gaming, casino, and horse racing. So there are two points uh, to be considered, uh, the rate as well as the value, which I will take it up uh, a bit later in the presentation. The other changes that we see are relating to the procedures. Uh, uh, Rutraj, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, procedures being clarified, provided. Uh, in many situations, uh, when an appeal is required to be filed, especially in case of Tran 1, Tran 2, we find that the order has not been uploaded on the website or there are some technical challenges because of which we are not able to see the copy of the order in which case filing an online appeal uh, 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 is not possible. It is not permitted by the portal. Uh, so they have specifically provided in case of TRAN1, TRAN2 claims, a manual appeal can be filed. Hopefully similar dispension should also be extended where there is a technological challenge and uh, the SACs are unable to file an online appeal. Another clarification issued is relating to the declaration to be filed by a goods transport operator if he wants to pay the tax under a forward charge instead of reverse charge. So far, there was a little clarity as to whether the declaration has to be filed annually or a one-time declaration is sufficient uh, where the GTA uh, you know, provides his intention to say that he would want to pay the tax under a forward charge. And now this uh, clarification says that one-time declaration is sufficient unless, of course, uh, the GTA wants to change the option and uh, would opt for a you know, tax under reverse charge. Till such time, uh, the declaration in advance would be continued to be available. Then certain forms have been provided to uh, issue notices wherever there is a mismatch. Uh, as an example, if there is a mismatch between 3B and uh, 2A, then DRC 01C uh, notice can be issued. Similarly, a form under GSTR 3A can be issued uh, if there is a, a failure to furnish uh, GSTR 9 by the companies. Uh, another important change is the relaxation provided in the reporting requirements for 99C for the previous financial year, which is 21-22. The benefit will continue to be available for the financial year 22-23. So, uh, Teething issues relating to you know providing HSN inward supplies or the detailed breakup uh, reconciliation between the ITC taken in 3B and the reporting of expense in the financial. So a relaxation from providing these details will continue to be available even for financial year 22-23. And of course, the uh, exemption from furnishing nine uh, for people having turnover up to two crore will also be available for the financial year 22-23. So these were some of the key changes 
which has been suggested uh, and uh, amendments made by the GST Council. And now uh, uh, we will see what are the important clarifications that has been issued and we'll take them up for discussion. Yeah, Neeraj, before we go to the uh, clarifications, I think out of all the proposals that you just discussed, uh, uh, as, as you rightly mentioned, imposing peak rate of uh, duty on online gaming uh, has garnered a lot of attention. Uh, so I wanted to ask you one question that what do you think is possibly the intent of council of imposing this rate? And also, where do you see uh, this rate imposition taking the online gaming industry year on? So second guessing the intention, I think would be difficult. Uh, there have been two uh, committees sort of, you know, preparing the report and submitting it to the council. And we see even in this council meeting, uh, the committee suggested that the discussion should be taken by the GST council instead of the committee sort of recommending what should be the taxation policy for online gaming. Uh, now, if you look at the two issues uh, which are sort of plaguing the sector, one is the rate and second is the value. So a uh, rate of 28%, perhaps the industry may still accept and live with, provided the value on which this rate has to be applied is the platform fee or the fee being charged by the gaming companies. So what the council has proposed is that instead of the tax being made applicable only on the platform fee, which is the consideration being sort of uh, received by the service provider, uh, the tax will be applied on the bet value. So either uh, if you buy the chips from the casino or the value that you place a bet or the amount that you sort of you know uh, use in the online gaming facility, that entire amount will be subject to 28%. And this has been the real bone of contention because it makes the entire business unviable. So let's say if 100 is something which a person is, is making a payment uh, for online gaming, 7, 28 to 30 rupees out of that 100 will go towards taxes. And only 70 will be available for uh, playing or placing the bets, which changes the entire dynamics of uh, probabilities of uh, win and loss and therefore it makes the entire proposition unviable and therefore we are seeing a lot of uh, protest and re representations from the industry asking to have a relook on this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Neeraj. Uh, now I think let's focus on the clarifications which have been issued by CBIC pursuant to this 50th uh, council meeting. I think the first and probably the most important clarification is in relation with ISD versus cross charge. This debate has been there since inception of GST. There were diverse practices which were followed by industry across. And we have seen several advanced ruling which has added fuel to this fire. Uh, so Kulraj, I would like to ask you that, uh, do you think this clarification which has come out, it has comprehensively dealt with all the issues or you feel that there are still some open ends to this issue? Yeah, thanks, Rudraj. So, Rudraj, before uh, we kind of discuss what this clarification is all about, let's kind of go back a bit and understand the issue. So, uh, when the GST, and in fact, pre the GST, uh, a head office used to receive certain services, and the only mechanism to transfer those services was via an input service distributing mechanism. In the GST, the mechanism was there. However, because under the GST law, two different registrations were treated as a distinct person, uh, taxpayer opted to cross-charge each other rather than distributing credit to a different ISD mechanism. Uh, this, this saved uh, compliances because you need not carry out a separate ISD registration. This also helped the taxpayers to ensure that uh, there is no uh, hard line to be followed in terms of turnover, in terms of credit. So as far as the entire credit is available to the recipient branch, uh, normally a valuation mechanism was chosen, which was nearly about an ISD. So in principle, ISD was followed, but through a different route as well. So therefore, the industry was at two different practices, ISD or a cross charge, due to which it related into litigations. Uh, uh, the significant amongst was the triple AR issued by Maharashtra authority in case of Cummins, wherein the authority said that ISD has to be the right route for distributing the common ITC. Cross-charge is not the correct mechanism. 
So that was one debate uh, that was going on. The audit officers did not really look into uh, the fact that cross-chat is a viable mechanism and was pushing for an ISD. The second debate that happened in, in a cross-chat situation uh, was what is the value of such cross-charge? Should you be distributing the entire ITC? Should you be in, including the value of salary cost of uh, the employees or no? The third issue that related to it, whether there is at all a service that was rendered by the head office to the branch offices. And those were the three principal issues that were there before the industry. The circular has tried to address some of them. The principal issue being that an ISD or a cross charge, whatever mechanism you follow, that should be fine. Um, so a larger debate of choosing an ISD over a cross charge or a vice versa gets kind of resolved. So as long as you are following one, uh, for distribution of common ITC, that should be a good compliance. The second debate of inclusion of salary cost of employees towards passing on the services that get rendered by a head office to a branch office or a vice versa situation has also been clarified. It has been said that uh, where the branch is entitled to a full ITC, the head office can adopt to any value and that value shall be adopted and taken to be an open market value for a GST payment purposes. It has even circular has gone to an extent to say that if no invoice has so been raised, then a nil value shall be uh, accorded to it and shall be accepted. So a large, large debate which the authorities were raising that the value of salary should be included in a cross charge or internal generated services gets over with this. So again, a very, very important relief to the industry. On the second point where the branches are not entitled to the entire ITC, uh, the uh, clarification provides that the salary cost shall not be included therein. So that's for, again, a very important uh, benefit given to uh, the taxpayers who are not completely in taxable business activities. Well, these are important principles uh, adopted and clarification has been given. Some points are still uh, debated and shall be debated is that uh, how should be the value for cross-chat be decided when branch is not entitled to an ITC? Should you be taking uh, a common expense? How should you be taking that valuation? It is something which is still largely debated. Second, while the entire circular talks about a situation of head office providing services to a branch office, there could be a vice versa situation where branches are located and they are supporting head office. Uh, typically in a situation where you have multi-branches location where head office is raising the ultimate invoice to the customer and branches are typically in a fulfillment center situation. So should there be a cross chart and should any value be accepted for those services? Those are a couple of things I think the, the circular has not addressed, but still a very welcome change. I think uh, much needed and a rightly came change because assessments of 17, 18 are happening and tax authorities are becoming aggressive over this point. We hope a large amount of litigation through this will get resolved. Uh, thanks, Bulraj. One question which comes to mind. So one of the important clarification which uh, has been provided now is that any value uh, of cross charge will be accepted so long as the receiving unit is able to take entire credit. Now, given this, will it be right to say that uh, this logic of accepting any value of cross charge can also apply to cross charges for allocation of common input tax credit? Uh, Neeraj, do you think this is something which is sustainable? This is something which can be considered correct legally? I think it's an interesting uh, uh, take uh, where we are sort of clubbing two clarifications uh, being issued in the same circular. See, as a concept, uh, what is the first clarification saying? That you have a provision of ISD for distribution of credits. Instead of ISD, you can opt for a cross charge. But the principle underlying uh, remains the same, that if it is a common credit, uh, which has been received by HO or any specific location, but it belongs to another location as well. Then in the uh, principle of, you know, destination-based consumption theory being made applicable, ideally that credit should go to that particular location. And providing a clarification to say that instead of opting for an ISD, you can issue a tax invoice, which is a cross-charge invoice. The second bit of clarification is related to the internally generated services, uh, which says that if you there is a provision of service and the recipient is entitled to full 
input tax credit, then whatever value that has been declared should be accepted. Now, this is in the context of an understanding that there is an internally generated service and it is not pertaining to distribution of credit. So if we sort of look both the clarifications, then the proposition uh, will not sustain to say that because it is a cross charge invoice, any value be accepted, which in effect would mean that the distribution of credit would not happen in the manner what is envisaged. Right, right. I think I think I agree to that. Uh, moving on to the next one, I think there's important clarification regarding warranty replacements. Warranty is a very common phenomenon among the product industry. Warranty can be given either by the manufacturer himself or it can also be routed to distributors, dealers, etc. There were all sorts of issues on surrounding warranty transactions. First, what is the taxability of warranty supplies? whether input tax credit is eligible in respect of goods which are given on warranty, uh, what is the taxability of transaction between dealers, distributors, etc. Uh, we have this uh, circular now. Uh, uh, Neeraj, do you think it is comprehensively taking care of all the issues which were concerning uh, warranty? Uh, what is your take on this? I think it largely uh, sort of provides clarification and the circular has gone into depth uh, to cover various scenarios. So if you look at the first scenario where the manufacturer himself is providing a, a warranty by replacing the part or repairing a part, and there is no consideration that is being charged. Now the warranty is given at the time of sale of any goods. And therefore the presupposition is the cost of providing that additional part or the repair services would already be been factored in the sale price on which tax has been discharged by the manufacturer or the supplier. Therefore, if any part is being replaced or any repair services being provided and nothing is being charged for the same, then it ought not to attract any GST, which has been clarified by the circular as well. The question always remained that if any part is being given on free of cost basis, uh, because it is under the warranty supply, then whether the restriction under section 17 should apply, which the circular has now clarified that uh, the restriction on taking credit on something which is supplied on free will not be applicable in this situation because this is part of the overall transaction where the cost of warranty has already been factored in the selling price by the manufacturer. Now let's look at the next scenario. It says that where the uh, repair service or the uh, replacement is done by the distributor instead of a manufacturer. And if the distributor is not collecting any consideration, whether from the manufacturer or from the customer, then the same principle will continue to be applicable and no GST will be charged uh, by the distributor. And they, because there is no specific consideration. If we look at the, uh, the next scenario, which is uh, uh, scenario C uh, in the next slide, where, you know, it's a, combination of transactions how distributor will do uh, you know take with, uh, uh, will will be done along with the manufacturer because so far as customer is concerned nothing has been recovered from the customer now if the distributor is sort of you know uh, recovering the cost of parts either there is an invoice uh, on the manufacturer because these are the parts which have been originally been purchased from the manufacturer and is uh, ownership and property of distributor, then of course, any consideration being charged by the distributor uh, will attract GST. And the manufacturer, because these parts are being used to service the warranty, which he was supposed to honor, will be entitled to claim the input tax credit on the same. Now, one interesting proposition would come as to the accounting treatment in the books of manufacturer, because while there is a purchase that will get recorded, now, there is no stock that would have come in or stock that would have go, uh, go out. So probably uh, under the SAP system, uh, if any purchase is being recorded, then uh, they may have to make necessary entry for stock in and stock out as well, because that's how the purchase will get recorded. Now, another uh, uh, situation which has been covered and clarified, where the parts are supplied by the manufacturer as a replacement. So instead of distributor charging anything, uh, to the manufacturer. The manufacturer agrees uh, to supply that and replace that part which has been used by the distributor. 
again, contain, continuing with the logic that no tax should be applicable because it is part of the overall transaction. Uh, no GST will be applicable on this supply. And of course, the manufacturer will not be reversing any input tax credit. The third uh, part, which has been clarified uh, by this circular, is envisaging a situation where the distributor would have used the part. Instead of raising an invoice on the manufacturer, the manufacturer will issue a credit note which is compliant under Section 34. Now, if you look at Section 34, a credit note can be issued in very limited uh, scenarios. One where the excess tax has been charged, which is not the case here. One where any deficient goods has been supplied, which is also not the case here. A third situation is if there is a sales return. So in a way, instead of showing as a sales from the distributor to the manufacturer, the transaction can be considered as a sales return uh, by the manufacturer by issuing a credit note under Section 34. Of course, the timelines also needs to be borne in mind. And if a credit note under Section 34 is issued, the tax adjustment can be claimed by the manufacturer only when the distributor also correspondingly reverses the input tax credit. So these are some of the factors uh, which needs to be borne in mind while uh, doing this transaction of a warranty replacement. Uh, Pulraj, one question for you. Uh, yep. Recently, there was a Supreme Court uh, ruling in case of Tata Motors, which uh, dealt with warranty issue. How do you see these uh, clarifications which have now come in? Do you think that the circular is following the rationale which was given by the Supreme Court ruling or it's in a way coming out with a different position altogether? Okay. So uh, let, let's understand what Tata Motors was all about. So Tata Motors contemplated a situation wherein a distributor is providing parts on behalf of the manufacturer to the customer those parts were either bought from the manufacturer or procured from third parties. And as a result, the distributor used to recover a consideration which used to come by way of a credit note from the manufacturer. The entire issue boiled down whether the credit note that was issued by the manufacturer could be constituted as a consideration for the part supply by the dealer to the customer. There were a plethora of rulings of the past of high courts, uh, and Supreme Court affirmed the ruling and said that a tax should, should be applicable. So it should be subjected to a, a VAT in the hands of distributor because there is a supply of goods by the distributor to the customer on behalf of the manufacturer. Now, applying that rationale to the current situation, all the points uh, are in agreement because there is no such situation contemplated. The only challenge with the circular brings about is when they talk about issuance of a credit note. So that if you can go to the slide back, uh, we'll, we'll discuss that position. So it contemplates that manufacturer may issue a credit note for replacement of part to the distributor. Now, here is where the a conflict, possible conflict arises from the Supreme Court ruling. Supreme Court said that when an accounting credit note gets issued, it is considered to be a, a supply transaction. However, the circular talks about the situation when the credit note gets issued, there is a technically a sales return transaction from the manufacturer to the distributor. So in a way, there is no conflict between two of them, but a situation of a credit note with GST getting issued and a situation of a credit note without GST getting issued both get slightly more contentious now. And, and uh, specifically because 34.2, which talks about credit note, does not really imposes a, a precondition to issue a credit note with GST or without GST credit note can altogether be issued. So would both situations be considered as a, as a sales return? Uh, and, and therefore a conflict to Supreme Court. In, in my view, there will certainly be debates around uh, the credit note part for sure. And it, it slightly gets into the venture where Supreme Court ruling also already had settled a law flat. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, moving forward, uh, I think the next clarification is dealing with ITC mismatches. ITC mismatches, I think, as all of us are aware of, is extremely debated topic. Uh, uh, every SSC is possibly sitting with a notice regarding this. Uh, last year, the board had given a circular uh, for, and prescribed a manner of dealing with the mismatches. But that circular dealt only with financial year 1718 and 1819. 
now we have a circular which is dealing or prescribing a mechanism for dealing with itc mismatches for period up to december 21 uh kulraj after seeing this circular do you think that this is again comprehensive and can we say that up till 21 december the itc mismatch issue is sorted or uh, we still have some challenges left on our way so largely it, it supports uh, it, it supports rutraj because uh, uh, itc mismatches has been a common issue and a common thread in all the litigations and uh, uh, the initial one in 2022 circular provided a relief that if you can get a, a certificate from a vendor if the itc mismatch is lower than 5 lakh rupees per annum or a certificate from chartered accountant if the mismatch amount exceeds 5 lakh rupees then that should be considered to be a good compliance and mismatch would be uh, considered uh, mismatch would not be uh, kind of considered towards uh, a tax credit demands now uh, there were disputes whether the circular of uh, should be applicable to a 1920 period where the phenomena and the law remain the same uh, and, and the larger question was whether circular will be applicable for 1920 because uh, a rule 36.4 came in, the, uh, in on October of 9th of, 2000, uh, of 2019, wherein a, a specific mechanism of availing credit basis, a certain percentage of credit which was available in two way was brought into picture. Uh, interestingly, there was a Supreme, uh, there was a High Court ruling in case of Wipro, which held that the mechanism shall so be applicable in 1920 as well, uh, but largely at a ground level, there were debates. So the circular uh, gives a huge amount of uh, support in terms of it saying prescribing the mechanism followed in 2020 through circular to be applicable as it is to the period April 19 to October 19, which is the period wherein uh, till 36.4 was not in picture. When 36.4 got into picture, uh, it provides that uh, the mechanism still be applicable, but the credit mechanism will be limited to the thresholds. So threshold for prescribing 36.4 was 20% of the available ITC in 2A, which was reduced to 10% and which was further reduced to 5% in January 2021. So uh, if the ITC mismatches are between these prescribed limits, uh, a certificate or a declaration from vendor will be useful. Uh, so to such extent, uh, the circular is extremely useful. Uh, from January 22 onwards, because the ITC was only eligible basis, the invoices that were reflecting in 2B, uh, the circular certainly uh, cannot be of any further use. So the credit gets restricted to the availability in 2B and therefore mismatches should not be there. Uh, importantly, as was mentioned in the 2022 circular, this circular will only be applicable to ongoing proceeding. If a proceeding has been closed, demands have been raised, you are into a litigation, etc., then the circular uh, will not be of so use. While, while all good things said about the circular, there are two points which uh, uh, still remains pretty vague and specifically for the period of October 19 onwards when 36.4 came into picture. One was that uh, which invoices because you have a delta there so technically the law doesn't require you to do an invoice was invoice matching in that period also because the grade was eligible to a delta percentages. Uh, which invoice should be taken or the SSB at liberty to take any invoice if within the threshold limit. Second point, which, which is very important is that a lot of these invoices pertains to past periods. So if you consider one specific period, you may be in a, in the given threshold limit, but because invoices for the past periods came into picture, the threshold gets breached. So what shall happen in those situations are the two points in my view, which still have not been addressed. And, and for these two points, we will have to see how the, uh, the ground realities react, how the, the, the assessment happened but largely a very important uh, circular and extremely beneficial to industry at large. Okay. Uh, moving forward, uh, we've seen that there are several clarifications on refund uh, which have been issued. Uh, Kulraj, would you like to quickly discuss details around these uh, clarifications? Yeah, yeah. So uh, all these clarifications uh, laid on certain, certain important positions because there were some challenges in the refund. The first one, uh, the government has clarified that the CBSE has clarified that uh, from January 22 onwards, because two week mechanism was brought into picture, so uh, refund will be eligible only to the extent that invoices were getting reflected in GSTR 2B. Uh, so they have just clarified this position. It is important to note that they have also clarified that if refunds have been issued in past basis 2A or basis a declaration that uh, that invoices were not in 2A and copy of invoices were submitted to the authorities, those refund claims will not be touched. 
But yes, if, if any refund claim has to be filed for this period onwards, to be shall be the necessary documents for computing the ITC. The second important clarification, which I think was a miss and uh, uh, has been brought in uh, over by a clarification was that uh, the explanation was inserted in, in last year, or July, July 22, wherein an explanation was inserted in rule 89.4 to provide that that value for uh, export for the purpose of refund computation should be lower of the tax invoice value or FOB value as declared in the shipping bill. While the numerator got impacted, the denominator did not got impacted by this. So the explanation has now clarified that that denominator, which is the adjusted total turnover, will uh, because it includes the domestic turnover and the value of exported goods, uh, the adjusted turnover should also be worked upon the basis of value of exported goods, which shall be derived on as per the explanation to rule 894. So for sure will impact positively in the refund claim applications. Large, uh, this, the last point that came again, uh, seems to be some sort of miss was not there, is a, a rule called 96A, which provides for condition of LUT. And it says that if an exporter is not able to export the goods within three months time from the date of invoice, or is not able to realize the foreign currency in case of services within one year time, then uh, the exporter necessarily has to pay IGST on the goods and IGST on the services uh, within a 15 days time, ending this three months and one year window. There were no concept around uh, what happens when we get, realize this amount again. Should this amount be refunded because technically export cannot be taxed? Uh, the circular now provides a much needed clarification to say that if taxes have been paid in past on the guys that there have been a non-fulfillment on realization of export currency or non-export within the prescribed period of three months, then uh, a refund of that amount paid would be entitled. Uh, the circular also importantly hides that because there has been a delay earlier, so uh, the taxpayer would have paid interest. A refund of interest shall not so be granted, so it will be only of the tax component. But again, something that was amiss and, and has been so very well clarified. Uh, okay, moving forward, uh, I think there's one very promising clarification which has come out in relation to uh, computation of interest in case of wrong availment of and utilization of IGST. Now, here one question, Neeraj, do you think this issue was actually uh, there? It was a matter of concern for many uh, taxpayers and also whether the clarification is now uh, providing a right relief uh, for that issue. Uh, see, uh, Ruturaj, uh, the relief was provided by, you know, amending the uh, section 50 to say that if you have taken any input tax credit wrongly, but did not take the benefit of that wrong availment because you never utilized it, then ideally the SSE should not have been penalized by charging interest because no benefit has been taken by taking the wrong credit. So if it is reversed before utilization, then no interest should be charged. Now, the way it could be interpreted is because we have independent legislations for central GST, state GST laws and IGST's law to say that each of them is a separate tax. And therefore, I will look at individual balances while considering whether there is an excess availment or not. Now, this uh, uh, way of interpretation ignores the fact that certain category of taxes can be cross-utilized. And IGST is the prime example to say that if I am, if I'm running short of CGST balance or an SGST balance, I can very well use the IGST balance. So technically, if there is a shortfall in any of these uh, head, whether C or S, I can be utilized. Now, the clarification has been issued for IGST to say that if there is a shortfall of IGST, I also can consider a CGST balance and a state GST balance. And it is only if I run out of all the balances, then I'm liable to pay interest. So absolutely a welcome clarification which will kind of, you know, nip the issue in the bud uh, before any tax authority can get into it and, you know, raise questions on that. And logically, while the circular is not saying so, uh, as I mentioned in the example, the same principle should equally apply whether it is a central GST shortfall or state GST shortfall. Of course, in that situation, you cannot look at the balances of state or central because they cannot be cross-utilized. But the balance of IGST in either situation 
should also be considered before deciding there is an excess utilization. Another factor, probably again, which is not covered by the circular is if there is a cash balance uh, maintained by the SSE apart from the ITC balances, then ideally in that situation, even a cash balance uh, ought to receive a similar treatment. And it is only if everything uh, is you know running out short, then interest should be charged. Right. So I think in short, uh, when I have to decide whether I need to pay interest or not, I should not be looking at only the IGST balance, but I should also look at the CGST and SGST balance in my ECL. So this should definitely help uh, taxpayers when they are computing their uh, interest liability, if at all. Uh, finally, moving to the last clarification uh, and which uh, I think surprisingly caught attention of the tax authorities is about taxability of holding shares or stake in a subsidiary. Uh, uh, Kulraj, can you just explain what this issue was and what the clarification is actually talking about? So uh, the uh, service entry uh, under the schedule we have under 997171 provided for an entry which stated that the service is provided by holding companies which is holding securities of companies or enterprise for the purpose of owning a controlling interest shall so be subject to a, a class a classification as a service transaction under double nine seven one seven one. So precisely this means that if a holding company holds equities for a subsidiary, then uh, it was a nomenclature that was given into a service entry. Uh, the tax authority specifically in the Bangalore zone. Uh, re issued notices. Uh, in fact, some of them got shoka notices as well, wherein uh, the tax department specifically applied this rationale and created tax demand and said that there is a service rendition by holding company in getting or holding securities of subsidiary companies. Now, uh, the second part that was a debated part that how shall the valuation of so val uh, so service be arrived. And, and there were various means and mechanisms that were used by tax authorities, be it earning per share, uh, be it the value which was uh, of, the of the shares value and so, and creating a lot of amount of nuisance and nuisance dispute. Uh, the, uh, in fact, in Karnataka High Court, in case of uh, Metro cash and carry stores, uh, the SSC took this issue before the High Court and High Court granted a stay as well. Uh, and this, in this industry, uh, the industry was getting impacted because either the holding will be in India, so taxes are being subject to in the hands of holding. And if holding happens out to be outside India, the taxes were subject to in the hands of subject and a reverse charge mechanism. Now, the clarification is specifically laid out, uh, said that, that securities do not qualify to be goods or services under the GST law. Mere activity of holding shares in a subsidiary, there is no uh, technically an activity just being performed by the holding in favor of subsidiary. Subsidiary does not get any benefited by it. So therefore, there is no service rendition per se. And it clarified that merely because an entry is there in the SSC schedule we have does not really mean that it will be taxed. So therefore, it's very important uh, clarification again will lead to a host of disputes around this, uh, specifically in the south part of the country getting resolved. Uh, and uh, a lot of nuisance around this entire issue will, will, will get settled with this clarification. So again, very welcome uh, overall. Yeah, and Kulraj, I think interestingly, this circular has come in very timely as in as of now, we've not started seeing a lot of notices on this ground. So before the issue could build up a lot across the country, I think the council has moved uh, swiftly and come up with this clarification in a very timely manner. So that's clearly a welcome move. So if I if I just may put in a very different perspective, so uh, it's a half century. So the, the GST council has ensured that they, they have their bat uplifted and say that they've done enough and more. And this was the situation that they did. Uh, a lot of these uh, clarification were much needed specifically because we were uh, closing on the first year of assessments and tax demands and show were being raised. So I think uh, from an industry perspective, uh, all these things are, are hugely welcome. Yeah. So as Neeraj mentioned in the beginning of the uh, webinar that it's raining all over and it's literally raining clarification and I think mostly all the clarifications that we discussed by far are welcome. They are pro uh, taxpayers. So it's a clearly uh, positive sign that we are seeing. 
uh, one thing I think we uh, must discuss is that uh, in the GST Council, they touched upon a lot of topics. Uh, many of them have converted into uh, clarifications, circulars, etc. Uh, but there were certain issues which the GST Council did talk about. For example, duty-free shop related issues uh, on which we have not seen the uh, clarification yet. Also, uh, there were some changes which one can expect uh, based on the 50th uh, council meeting recommendations around changes in the rules. For example, uh, there were talks about OIDAR services related uh, changes in the returns, etc. So uh, in times to come, I think we can expect that there will be rules uh, amendments which will be brought in by CBIC, uh, declared by CBIC about uh, these OIDAR and other matters which were discussed by the council. And also one important point, uh, and Kulraj, if you want to reflect upon it, is that uh, one thing which the uh, council mentioned while dealing with the cross-charge ISD issue is that it categorically mentioned that going forward, if the uh, government wants, it can make the ISD mechanism mandatory. So while up till now, looking at the current law, how it is placed, the council has clarified that ISD is not mandatory. But on a going forward, they may make ISD a mandatory requirement. So any any thoughts on this before we move to a question and answer session? No, that, that will be an interesting one if it comes across and, and whether that need still arises or not is again something that needs to be seen because uh, in so many words, the 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 count the, the clarification is that be it cross charge or be it the ISD could be both a suitable mechanism for distribution of credit. So at all, if a need of ISD remains, then why? That, that, that's a larger question that we, we probably need to ponder upon. But yes, if that comes across, then, then uh, there would be challenges to the industry because moving to an ISD mechanism is really a complex exercise in terms of changing a new registration, updating the vendors, following a different process and so. Uh, but yes, again, uh, from a larger litigation perspective, because an internal generated services, and as as we mentioned in the last in uh, uh, earlier in the session, that how a cross charge happens is again uh, an SSC's own attribute. So uh, I think to resolve everything, an ISD mechanism should be the future. But yes, uh, it needs to be seen in what shape and form it comes across. Uh, uh, and if it does, in larger and again, a lot of litigation get resolved. Neeraj, would you like to have some thoughts? We uh, we've been talking about this quite often. Sure. If you see, actually, section twenty four. Uh, which talks about mandatory registration and ISD has been listed as a category of mandatory registration. And the question that has been deliberated is, uh, where, I mean, what makes it mandatory? If I decide to distribute the credit in a manner uh, by not adopting ISD, will uh, I still qualify under section 24 to say that, you know, ISD is mandatory in effect, uh, whether the provision of law in the current situation, uh, current state itself, sort of compels a company to register as an ISD for distributing the credit. Because again, the way the input service distributor has been defined as a uh, HO uh, or an office which receives a, a input service invoice, which belongs to other location as well and distributes credit. So that has been sort of, uh, you know, the debate as to it's only when I intend to distribute, then I qualify as an ISD and therefore uh, I become sort of, you know, uh, it becomes mandatory on me to obtain that registration. I think things also got a little confusing when they decided to amend section 23 in this budget. Uh, when section 23 talks about, you know, people who are exempted from registration to say that if uh, any person having a turnover, which is fully exempted, then the provisions of section 24 will not apply. Uh, which would mean that if I am having a fully exempt uh, category, then ISD will not be available. So technically, if it is fully exempt, then the question of ISD also should not arise in that situation. But there were other several categories uh, in Section 24, like registration, if you have to pay uh, TCS or a reverse charge obligation, which would have also got nullified. So a lot of things happened around Section 24, 23, which uh, kind of you know created a confusion whether ISD should be considered as mandatory uh, or not. Uh, and therefore, this circular at least kind of settles that debate uh, to say that probably they will bring in provisions which will make it uh, more explicit and clear as to why ISD is mandatory. And from that period onwards, uh, uh, the companies will have to adopt and switch to this uh, uh, 
a mechanism of following the ISD route for distribution of credit and a cross-charge invoice will not be accepted after that date. Right. Uh, with this, I think we can uh, uh, now open the floor for Q&A session. Uh, I can already see quite a few questions in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, any participants who wish to ask further question, you can type in your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, looking at the time, as many questions that we can answer, we will take it up during the session. And those questions which we are not able to answer in the uh, session, we will come back to you through email IDs, I mean, uh, through an email response. Uh, I think the first question, I think Neeraj, that's uh, for you. Uh, it deals with the clarification given in respect of food beverages supply at 5% uh, uh, in the movie halls. So the question is that, is this clarification, uh, will up, whether it will get extended to shop outside the theaters also? That's uh, the first question that we have. No, so a shop outside the theater, I'm not sure uh, what would mean by that if you're referring to, let's say a food court in a, uh, a mall, uh, then technically uh, what you buy uh, in a shop, which is outside the theater, that would not attract the rate applicable to a movie ticket uh, to begin with. That will be, uh, you know, attracting the rate applicable to a food supply. So, so really speaking, the clarification should not have any relevance over there. It is meant to apply in a situation where you go in a theater and you're buying uh, something within the theater premises. Right, right. Uh... Okay, moving on to the next question, I think uh, Kulraj, you can take this. This deals with the cross-charge uh, issue. Now here the question is, in case the recipient uh, branch office is not able for entire input tax credit, uh, whether the self-generated services uh, cross-charge should include expenses like electricity, gas, cam charges, rent, etc. So uh, Ruturaj, we had discussed this. So uh, that's an open point that if the recipient branch is not entitled to credit, what shall be the torture? So uh, probably the count, the, the the government did not really wanted to comment upon it, and therefore it's a left open question. Uh, but in in my view, uh, all such expenses which can be you can be said to be common in nature, which is used for the branch office and head office, uh, should be proportionately allocated. Uh, uh, and specifically the expenses which have a GST incident should be so that there is no GST arbitrage that is there because you're getting an input GST and you're passing it off to the branch. Uh, but yes, again, we, we, we have to see uh, some more litigations around it because that's not something very strictly covered by this clarification. But yes, what is important is that salary cost is not there, but what all expenses have to be covered still remains to be an open question. Right. Uh, I think we have a lot of questions on this cross charges as expected. So the next one is, I found it very interesting, the question, uh, which is basically, in a way, questioning the validity of the clarification to a certain extent. The question is saying that uh, uh, when HO receives services for uh, head office as well as branch office, and as per circular, you can issue a tax invoice uh, under section 31 for allocation or distribution of input tax credit. But in terms of section 31, uh, invoice is to be issued for supply of goods or services. So is it correct that uh, such invoice shall be issued for allocation of ITC? So in a way, the question is around, uh, you know, legality of issuance of invoice for, under section 31 for distribution of uh, ITC. Uh, this has been your... Uh... No, so... So that has been, you know, uh, debated a lot to say what are the consequences of issuing a tax invoice for cross-charging a credit. And uh, if you see the penal consequences of it as well under section 132, uh, where any tax invoice is issued without involving any supply, then it's a prosecutable uh, offense, etc. But see, if Council in, in its wisdom have given their clarification and really it is more about uh, the revenue neutrality of the situation uh, to say that instead of option A, if you have taken option B. So if you are issuing a tax invoice without any supply, obviously it will uh, invite uh, penal consequences. So it has to be seen from that perspective that it is allowing 
a certain practice which has been adopted uh, by the industry and which has go got no downsides if the uh, idea was to distribute the credit instead of isd if the companies have chosen the option of a cross charge by raising and that that can be done only by issuing a tax invoice because that is how the tax can be charged and the credit can be taken uh, by the recipient location then the benefit of clarification should be available without really actually getting into the legality of it right uh, another one i'll take one more on this uh, cross charge issue uh, this i think is a question which is there on minds of many uh, which is around what do you mean by uh, unit is available for full input tax credit so the question is uh, when someone is doing rule 42 reversal does it mean that they have failed the full itc available test or do we look at, need to look at it differently uh, neera would you like to take that uh, i'm not very clear in the question but let me attempt to address it i think if the intention is to say that if you have received uh, uh, let's say some goods which is taxable goods and uh, obviously since the goods are taxable when you are supplying again you are charging tax on that so to that extent a uh, receipt of an input should be considered to be fully uh, uh, you know the credit should be fully available because in the entire value you are paying the tax so to that extent i think uh, it needs to be seen from the prism of how that input is going to be used whether it is a, a specific input for a specific supply or a input for a common supply right right uh, kulraj next question is on a refund uh, so from jan 2022 the refunds will be allowed in cases uh, only in cases where uh, invoices are appearing in to be uh, so in this context the question is that what will be the position of refund in case of import and rcm itc uh, if it doesn't get reflected in to be uh, what happens to the refund so rudraj in, in, in my uh, view, uh, there is an annexure that needs to be furnished while you file a refund claim application. And that annexure uh, largely talks about uh, the input services that we receive. Uh, I don't think so. The circular uh, intends to cover situation of RCM and import of services within SAMPIT because uh, that's not legally mandated. And RCM case credit we take uh, once we generate our own self invoices. and. Uh, Technically, to be does not really get applied to an invoice or a dev, uh, to be doesn't really get applied to a bill of entry situation. So, in my view, both these uh, RCM credits and import of services, import of goods credit, should not get impacted by uh, this circular clarification specifically. Right, right. Uh, the next question is uh, uh, in case of ISD registration to uh, in case of ISD registration with head office, how to pay tax under reverse charge. Uh, Kulraj, you would like to take that? Uh, there is a, a, a set of clarification on this that uh, we need to take another registration, pay taxes, and then uh, through an invoice, transfer the uh, GST soap pay to the ISD registration, and then ISD registration will always distribute it to the other branches and other registrations. Right. Uh, uh, there's one question on interest computation. Uh, Neeraj, I'd like to uh, direct that to you. So the question is, we have sufficient balance in cash ledger, but we have no balance in the credit ledger. So should we pay interest in case of ITC reversal? I think this is something which I mentioned uh, during the presentation. While the circular uh, does not explicitly uh, provide uh, for this situation, but in my view, if the objective is uh, uh, to say that uh, if the funds are available uh, with the government uh, in terms of credit or cash, then uh, you know this benefit can be extended but there is only one exception uh, to this uh, proposition is when you're talking about uh, a credit being wrongly taken and that being reversed versus a situation where credit which has been wrongly taken has already been utilized because now the balance is zero but you have a corresponding cash liability so uh, to that extent, if there is nothing available in credit balance, then probably the benefit will not be available and there will be a distinction between the two situations. Okay, okay. I think there are quite a few questions which are there, but uh, looking at the time, I think we can take one more question before we close. Uh, 
Kulraj Neeraj, yes, what do you think? Absolutely. Yeah. And then so, we will try to uh, respond on email wherever uh, the questions have remained unanswered. Okay, so I'll just take one last question. Uh, this again pertains to cross charges. I think that's uh, something uh, of interest for everyone. So the question is, in case of cross charges, will payment to head office by branch within 180 days uh, is a requirement in order to comply with section 16 and in order to take uh, credit? Uh, Kula, would you like to take that? Uh, yeah, Rudraj. So there is a specific uh, rule towards it, uh, Rule 37, which uh, which mandates that uh, the payment requirement will not arise while you transact with distinct persons. So I don't think so. Uh, 180 days condition will at all be applicable when a cross charge invoice is so raised. Okay. All right. I think uh, that will be all. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating. The answers which we couldn't, uh, uh, the questions that we couldn't answer during the session, we'll reach out to you through your email IDs. Uh, so thank you very much for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.